I am excited about doorknobs, those wonderful little objects that open our doors. The doorknob was actually invented here in Vienna in 1771 by a woman named Johanna Bauer. The daughter of a clockmaker, Johanna loved to tinker. And when her father needed a more secure way to lock away their family valuables than the simple cot latch of the day provided, her ingenuity sprung forth and a twist-pull revolution was upon us. Within decades, doorknob mania swept across Europe, over the Atlantic, and into the United States. You could say, Johanna literally opened the door <laughs> for all of us. You could also say, none of that is true. And you should say that, because it's not. I made it up. <laughs> Look, I, I tried to figure out who invented the doorknob. There was a patent issued in 1878, but then I found out that Louis XIV apparently had some pretty fancy doorknobs more than a century earlier than that, so I don't know. There is no readily available story on the invention of the doorknob. Why? <laughs> because the person who first did it didn't write it down? Dear diary, cabbage soup again today. Also, I invented the doorknob. <laughs> Regardless of who invented the doorknob, how many of us really know how one works? I didn't. I had to YouTube it, which is actually my job. I have a YouTube channel called Vsauce2 where I explore science, math, history, psychology, philosophy, and etymology in an attempt to extract an understanding from what seem like pretty basic questions but end up having surprisingly complex answers. Okay, so how does a doorknob work? Well, there's a spindle inside that turns these little things called cam drive units, which can rotate in either direction. So you can turn a doorknob left or right, and it still moves the transmission plate, which pulls a spring-loaded latch from its recessed position within the drive plate, which is that thing that's attached to the door frame. And the knob itself has a spring, so if you turn it and let go, it automatically returns to its original position, otherwise, when you wanted to close a door, you'd have to manually re-latch it shut every time, which would be annoying. When you lock a doorknob, what you're doing is a driver inside the spindle pushes a cam into a notched position within the rosette so that another cam can't rotate. And if it can't rotate, then, well, the door is locked. But unless you design doorknobs for a living, do you need to know any of that? No, of course not. You can successfully walk in and out of doors your entire life without having to know the engineering, manufacturing, and global economics that come together to cram a knob in every door. And that's not even getting into the mining of ore, extracting of metal through furnaces, smelting, and electrolytic processes that that's needed to create the raw materials just to make a doorknob. The point is, doorknobs are boring. <laughs> Virtually no one thinks about doorknobs. But they're also amazing. And we're surrounded by secretly complex yet seemingly simple objects every day. And our general reaction to them is something like, eh, <laughs> which doesn't necessarily make us ungrateful, but it does make us human. Through a process known as sensory gating, the part of our brain known as the thalamus helps us block out sensory information. Otherwise, we would be seeing and hearing everything all around us, all at once, all the time which would probably be overwhelming. Sensory gating is why you can hone in on a football game while a loved one is two feet away trying to tell you about their day, and you don't hear a single thing that they're saying. 
You're just watching the game. Sorry, honey. I'm sensory gating. <laughs> Our minds turn the infinite complexities of reality into a manageable, survivable environment. We learn that doorknobs twist and you pull on them and we just leave it at that low resolution level of understanding. A level of understanding that masks the hidden genius of doorknobs. The hidden genius of toilets. The hidden genius of the fact that I traveled over 4,000 miles to get here and I'm chock full of vitamin C and my teeth are not falling out. I'm going to explain why my teeth aren't falling out, but first I want to tell you about why I drank toilet water. <laughs> so the way that I make videos on Vsauce 2 is by reading books, scientific papers, watching documentaries, and speaking with experts all around the world, and then taking what I've learned and kind of funneling it into a hopefully entertaining YouTube video. It's like sensory gating knowledge. One day I was wondering why we use fresh water, clean water, the same water that comes out of the tap to flush our waste. It kind of seemed like a waste. So I made a video called the water fountain you pee in. And I pose next to my toilet with a slice of pizza and a comically large straw. This is my only slide. <laughs> I'll just put this down now, I guess. <laughs> the question, why do we use clean water to flush waste, turned into a video detailing the history of sanitation, the invention of the sewage system, the fact that sanitation is widely regarded as the most important medical advancement of all time, the problems we still face today in regards to sanitation in developing countries, and even a philosophical outlook on the role of human waste in the cycle of nature detailed by Austrian-born painter Friedensreich Hundertwasser. The toilet bowl is an ordinary object that contains a bottomless amount of sophistication and significance. But we don't potty train babies by making them learn that the S-trap allows standing water to block foul air. They don't need to know that. You don't need to know that. But the important thing is, somebody does or else we forget how to cure scurvy. Okay, so when I mentioned my teeth not falling out earlier, I was referencing scurvy, a disease that we've largely forgotten about that's caused by a deficiency of vitamin C. And it leads to fatigue, swollen gums, teeth falling out, and eventually death. There's a short list of animals whose livers don't synthesize vitamin C and human beings are on that short list. We need to get vitamin C from food. The good news is that it's only about 10 milligrams a day that we need of vitamin C to stave off scurvy. About eight ketchup packets. <laughs> I did the math on that. The bad news is that when you have millions of sailors stuck on ships for weeks at a time, eating a strict diet of salted meat, biscuits, and beer, vitamin C content zero, you have the age of sail also being the age of scurvy. During that time, ships were often loaded with 50% more sailors than they needed because they knew half of the men were going to die from scurvy. 
In the first reported clinical trial ever, Dr. James Lynn separated scurvy suffering sailors into pairs, and then he gave them different purported cures. The pair who ate lemons and limes quickly recovered from their symptoms. So, yay, scurvy was cured. Until it wasn't. The problem was that Lynn's understanding with why the lemons worked was couched in the medical worldview of his time. So he concluded that <coughs> sailors are wet all the time, so they don't sweat properly, so acidic fruits help restore their body's pH balance. That's not why, that's, no. No, <laughs> no. That's, that's not why the lemons worked. But for a while, Lynn's discovery worked. Ships were loaded with a lemon concentrate, and sailors were ordered to drink a daily lemon sugar cocktail. But when lemons became expensive, they switched to limes, which are more acidic, but contain half the vitamin C. And by the early 20th century, we still did not understand scurvy. So when baby formula was first invented, it contained no vitamin C, and thousands of infants died. The simple solution of eat lemons to cure scurvy was too simple of an explanation. We needed to understand the hidden mechanism by which lemons cured scurvy. We needed to understand how the doorknob works. Lind was trying to balance the four humors when what he needed was the complexity of chemistry. Guinea pigs are one of the other animals who don't make their own vitamin C, and scientists stumbled upon the ability to research scurvy while studying guinea pigs. And this eventually led to the isolation of vitamin C. And today, Vitamin-enriched foods make obtaining vitamin C so effortless that on the rare occasion some college student decides it's a good idea to eat nothing but white rice for a semester and shows up feeling sick to the doctor, it could take the doctor a few minutes to diagnose scurvy. Because we don't think about it. We, we don't have to. When it comes to scurvy, the real-life wizards who came before us figured out something complex to make our lives today just a little more simple. The classic scholarly wizard archetype is a person alone in a tower, surrounded by stacks of books, surrounded by the collected knowledge of the time. And they spend their time reading, experimenting, writing to other wizards in far-off kingdoms, and then taking that wisdom to the king or queen to hopefully improve the lives of the commoners. I am not a wizard. I am a commoner. I don't have a PhD. I don't have a master's. I don't claim to have any particular expertise on any specific subject. I make YouTube videos in my house. <laughs> but I can have pretty much any book I want shipped to my door in two days or downloaded immediately onto a tablet. I can go online and access and add to the collected knowledge of my time. And I can email and correspond with scholarly wizard archetypes all around the world instantly, which makes me feel kind of like a wizard's apprentice. And for the first time in human history, we all have the ability to learn as much about our world as we can sensory gate or focus on. And there's an endless wealth of knowledge hidden in the most mundane of objects. So when I walk around sometimes, and you might want to try this, I turn off my this object is boring filter, and I decide to learn about it. 
And when I do, without fail, every single time, I'm amazed by how beautifully complex, yet perfectly simple, an object like a doorknob or a toilet or a ketchup packet can be. We live in a world gifted to us by countless wizards who dreamed, discovered, and invented, all in the hopes that one day their revolutionary idea could achieve the highest honor in all of humanity, become boring. And as always, thanks for watching. Thank you.